This is the Sitam Worship Service. Good morning, good morning, and welcome to Sitam Broadcast Service. My name is Reverend Kwame Rubadiri. It is really a joy to have you all tuned in to enjoy the worship service that we're about to enjoy. Uh, Bishop, it's been roughly a month now, a little over a month uh, since we started the partial lockdown, and we've been living our lives, as it were, on a screen. Uh, how, how does one sort of prepare yourself for a worship experience living uh, virtually, living digitally? You can be in a crowd of 10,000 people, 50,000 people who are lost in worship of God, and yet you can be very dry right in there. Uh, because you are not connecting with God yourself. So the important thing is not how many people are around you, but are you connecting with God at a personal level? Whether you have a thousand people around you or you are alone, you can have a very deep experience if you have set your heart in the right place. And so even during this time when uh, some, of, uh, some of us may be totally alone in their houses, there's nobody else, you are watching at a screen, whether on a TV or online, uh, you can still have a very deep experience with God. Are, are there some practical pointers that you might want to give us, Bishop, a uh, couple of nuggets? How, how do we do this if we're living in a house, if we're living in a bed sitter? What are some of the practical things that we could do to prepare ourselves for a worship experience like we're about to have? The worship experience is all about the heart. Jesus told the woman at the well, that uh, the true worshipers are people who worship God in spirit and in truth. And so if you are going to have a true experience with God in any worship experience, whether it is online or physical, the important thing is you prepare yourself. And especially now that you're in your house, there are so many distracting factors. One is that wake up and prepare yourself the normal way you go for a normal service. Do not do service in your bed. Do not do service in your pajamas. Do not do service in a place where you'll be distracted. That move from your bedroom, if you are in a bedroom, or just from your bed, if you are in a bed sitter, to a place where you meet with God, will set your mind in such a way that you are able to listen to God. Number two, dress up. You know, the way you normally dress up, maybe not as elaborate as you normally do, but you are going to meet with the maker of heaven and earth. Imagine if the president was going to come to your house. Would you go out in your pajamas? No. So dress up, prepare yourself, groom yourself, and pray before you go. And just ask God, Lord, like Samuel uh, was told, speak, thy servant heareth. So go out with a spirit and attitude of listening to God, and God will speak to you. But also, there are very many challenges with uh, broadcast services uh, because we are depending on technology, and we are dealing with people that are not near you. And you could see many, many things that could be rectified, many things that are going wrong. Uh, somebody has said the wrong thing. The worship team is not singing in the right way. Please take the attitude of worship. Send a message if you see something, but don't begin criticizing. Oh, now they are not doing this. They are not doing that. That will rob you of an encounter with God. If you see something, send a message and say this could be rectified, but focus on God because God wants to speak to you. So don't allow yourself to be distracted by too many other things. Just allow God to speak to you. We are just about to go into the service, and uh, what a great day. The Bible says, David says, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Let that be your attitude even as we get to the service right now. Welcome to Sitam Broadcast Service. Enjoy yourself.
out upon the sea, raise the dead. Reigning majesty, mighty God. Everything written about you is great. Oh, you are great, yes, you are. Holy One, oh, walked upon the sea, praise the dead. All oh, the rain and majesty, mighty God, oh, everything written about you is great. Oh, say you are great, you are great, you are great.
Amen. Why don't you just join us at this very hour and this very moment and just tell him, wherever you're watching us from, just tell him, Lord, I need you. I need you in my heart. I need you in my mind. I need you, Lord, upon my very own life. I need you, Jesus, in this place, oh God. Just go ahead and tell him and make this prayer on behalf of your family, on behalf of the nation. Just go ahead and tell him, Lord, I need you. We need you, Jesus. Indeed, Father, Lord, as the word indeed tells us in the book of Psalm 27, that truly, oh God, one thing we desire is that we will dwell in your house, oh God, gazing upon your beauty, oh God. And Father, this is our prayer today, that you will come and fill our lives. You will come and fill our homes. You will come and fill us, Lord, as a people and as a nation. And such a time as this, O oh God, when we look at what is happening around us, Lord, indeed our eyes are focused upon you, Jesus. And we are grateful today, knowing that, Lord, when we call, and we cry unto you, O oh God. You hear us and you come through for us, O oh God. We give you glory and honor for in Jesus' name we have prayed and believed. Amen. 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 Well, I take this time to welcome you to Sitam our broadcast service. It's such a joy to have you tune in. Uh, I know some of us could be uh, watching us from our homes, in the bedroom, in the living room, as a family. Some of us could be uh, watching uh, from a hospital bed. But we're so grateful that you could tune in. One of the things I've come to realize is that we have a huge uh, audience all across the world. And thank you if you're joining us from Kenya, other parts of Africa, Asia, Europe, uh, North and South America, Australia, thank you for tuning in. A special shout out to you uh, all the way in uh, Sitam, Romania. Thank you uh, for tuning in. And during this season, we know that uh, movement has been restricted and we'd like to invite you and welcome you to join in every single day. We have inspiration and hope available for you. For more information on how and where you can find us, please uh, uh, just click on this clip. Thank you. A very warm welcome to every last one of you receiving us on Hope TV, Hope FM, and those of you streaming live at Satan Church Online. This is your Satan Broadcast Service. Serving you throughout this special season on air and online. We are so glad you could join us today for this special family service. For our young people, there is a special youth service every Saturday at 6 p.m. Our children can now enjoy Sunday school in age-appropriate services every Sunday from 9 a.m. for the ages of 5 and below and from 9.20 a.m. for ages 6 to 12 years old. Prepare your children in good time to enjoy their services before joining the family service at 10 a.m. Please note that an online service is just as powerful as being in a physical church building. To benefit from the service, number one, prepare your mind and heart to hear from God. Number two, avoid every distraction and participate actively in the service. Our God is Emmanuel, God with us. He is present with you right where you are. Our need for prayer has never been greater than in this season. Please join us on Tuesday and Wednesday for the midweek prayer services from 6 p.m. Coming to you on Hope TV and Hope FM and live streamed at Satan Church Online. Come, let us call on the name of the Lord for our families, the nation, and the world. Are you in a safari group? If not, you are missing out on great spiritual fellowship and support from fellow believers in your area. 
Many small groups are connecting through various social media platforms and meeting by Zoom. If you're not in a Safari group, please send us a message on our WhatsApp numbers. That is our Airtel number 0784-277-277 and our Safaricom number 0728-221-221. And we will guide you on how to join one in your area. Do not let this lockdown lock you out of fellowship. If you need any pastoral support, please get in touch with your local pastor. You can also contact us on our WhatsApp number 0784-277-277, that is our Airtel line, and 0728-221-221 for our Safaricom line. You can also connect with us through our social media handles. Please indicate your name and assembly that you attend. God bless you and thank you for staying with Satan Broadcast Service. Enjoy the rest of the service. Park University has invested heavily on online teaching and learning infrastructure. The library is exactly set for that. You can access information anywhere. You don't have to come to the university. Having gone through it myself, I can tell you for a fact that online learning is so much more rigorous and much more beneficial than anything I've ever gone through. Park University pioneered uh, online learning in this country, especially at master's level. I believe this is a great way uh, the future direction of education and I would like to invite anybody who wants to take serious education to consider Park University through the online learning platform. Welcome to Park University where leaders are made. the point of intercession and I would like for us to do this in three stages. Psalms 24 says that the earth and the Lord, the, the earth and the fullness thereof belong to the Lord. Even those of us who dwell there belong to him. So one of the things I want us to do now is to acknowledge God's sovereignty over our lives, over this nation. The same psalm says, asks, who can ascend to the mountain of the Lord? And it says, those that have clean hearts and pure hearts, those that have not bowed to idols. So as we acknowledge his sovereignty, would we also come to repentance so that we can ascend to his mountain? Shall we pray? Almighty and everlasting Father, creator of heaven and earth, giver of all life, this morning we profess with our lips even what we believe in our hearts that you are sovereign above all. There is none above you, Father. There is none besides you. There never was and there never will be. Glory and honor to your name. Yet, Lord, if there be any that has been enthroned above you, we dethrone them this morning. Father God, we declare that creation, what we see and what we do not see, has come from you. Even the very bread that we have, Lord, you have given. This morning, Father, we submit that unless you build the house, those that labor, labor in vain. 
unless you watch over us father it is in vain that we try to do anything jehovah indeed your word tells us even if we should cast dice father it is you that determines which side it will fall on so this morning lord we surrender and submit to your sovereignty to your authority and to your rulership lord together we say may your kingdom come may your will be done in our lives and in this land father god you tell us that if we want to ascend to your mountain we must have clean hearts and pure hearts lord we must be of contrite hearts and broken spirit and be holy even as you're holy this morning father that we confess that we fall short of that criteria for lord we have sinned when we have been corrupted and corrupted others lord when we have shed innocent blood jehovah when we have borne false witness father Dear Lord, when we have not been diligent with what you've given us, Jehovah God, when we have oppressed the widows and the orphans and you've asked us to take care of them, when we have not bowed your word in your heart, Jehovah, as you require, when we have elevated other things above you, Lord, and put our eyes on man and systems, Father God, instead of you. Lord, we have sinned. Father, we have been disloyal to you and we have no right jehovah to come to your presence this morning except by your mercy and that is what we plead father god we can only start on the promise that if we confess our sins you will forgive us and hear us so this morning father on my own behalf on behalf of families on behalf of your church on behalf of this nation I repent of our unrighteousness, Jehovah. Lord, I plead that you'd not count our sin against us. Instead of looking at us, Lord, look at the finished work of Christ at the cross because that's the only way we can stand and it is in your name we come to you. Because of Jesus Christ, may our prayer, Lord, before you be like incense and our lifted hearts, Lord, be like an evening sacrifice. We bless you lord and we thank you for hearing our prayer amen at this point i would like us to come before god to petition him for the nation and the nations that have been affected by this pandemic that has been going on uh, i would request you to pray as the lord leads you as the lord brings to remembrance but before we do that i would like us to give thanks to god shall we pray Everlasting Father, you say that a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors you. So this morning, Lord, as your people, we come before you to say thank you. Thank you, Father, for who you are. You're gracious, you're merciful, you're loving, you are forgiving, Lord. You're long-suffering, otherwise we would have been destroyed a long time ago. We thank you for what you've done for us as individuals and as a nation. Lord, for salvation, for provision, that we can worship you, Jehovah God, freely. We thank you. As a nation, Lord, we can attest that you have been good to us, you have favored us father we have faced all manner of challenges lord pestilences locust invasions flooding droughts even terrorism jehovah god but in the face of all those you have preserved us and we say thank you jehovah god if the, even this pandemic that we have faced we have seen your hand in it jehovah indeed as a nation we have seen your favor. Father, we confess that the destiny and the purpose you have for this nation is great. And we declare that nothing and no one shall thwart it, Jehovah God, until it is accomplished. Yet as a nation, Lord, we are faced with many challenges, Father. We want to present those challenges before you this morning. And as we come before you, Lord, we don't become from a point of defeat, but a point of victory. Indeed, like David, Father, we can say we have seen you in the past kill lions and bears for us. And therefore, we are persuaded nothing that comes our, our way, Lord, is too great for you jehovah god 
So this morning, Father, we want to present the leadership of this nation before you. The men and women, Father God, that you've charged with the responsibility of steering this nation at a time such as this. In a special way, Lord, we want to bring our president, His Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta, before you. We want to bring the deputy president, His Excellency William Ruto, before you. We want to bring all the men and women that are supporting them at a time such as this. Lord, you led Moses through a difficult desert. Joshua, Lord, through unfamiliar territory, Father, and David in the midst of enemies, Lord. We feel like that is our situation now, Lord, and we pray as you led those great men, would you give our leaders, Lord, special wisdom, special grace, and discernment at a time such as this. We particularly pray for the seers of health, Jehovah God, at this time, and the teams working with him. Would you give them divine wisdom? Would you refresh them? Would you renew their strength, Jehovah? Protect the medical fraternity that is in the front line, Jehovah over fighting this pandemic, Lord. Give their families peace, Lord, because we know they are worried, everlasting, Father. And Lord, even as we bring Kenya before you, we bring the other nations that have also been affected before you. A time like this, Jehovah God can cause anxiety and distress. But Father God, we know you've done it before and you will do it for us oh father we remember lord even those in our nation that could be distressed anxious afraid lord because they have been affected by this pandemic one way or another some have lost jobs some have lost loved ones lord some businesses have closed jehovah god we pray for peace we pray for stillness father and above all lord i pray that you would make a way for them as only you can we thank you lord because you've got all this figured out and you will make a way for us in jesus name we pray now finally i would like us to pray that even in the midst of all these things god's will would be done and father god we pray that even in the midst of all these your will would be done that the purposes you have for this season would be achieved above all father that revival would finally come to kenya i pray lord that your will be done and your kingdom come we have prayed this believing and trusting in the name of jesus is a form of worship and unto the Lord and we give because it is God's nature to give. So we give because our God is a giver. So I'd like you just to prepare to give
to the Lord. And I'll also take this time to thank each and every one of us who has been faithful to give even during this season. Let us pray for the giving. Lord, I thank you for the giving of your people. Indeed, Lord, we give because you desire of us to give. I pray that your blessing will rest upon every single one of us, O oh God. And as your word tells us in the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 10, O oh God, Father, as we give towards your kingdom and unto un un your work, O oh God, Lord, may you come and destroy every works of the devourer in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that you are with us and that, Lord, you will continue providing unto us in your special manner. I know that some of us, Lord, are going through a very difficult season financially, Lord. We look to you now as the Lord, our provider. Father, may you provide unto that person who is watching us right now in your special way. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Please watch this so that you can be able to know how best you can give electronically. Thank you. It is now time to worship God through our giving. Please prepare yourself to give. We want to thank you for your continued support of God's work even in these very difficult times. We have seen a true demonstration of the Macedonian church, which gave cheerfully and generously in spite of their own desperate situation. We pray that God who sees in secret will reward you openly and abundantly. During this season, we have a common payment platform for all our giving, irrespective of which assembly you attend and also for our visitors. Please make all mobile payments through our M-Pesa and Airtel money payable number which is 933-934. For the account name, please indicate the CITEM assembly you attend. If you are not a member of any CITEM assembly, just write offering in the account space. If you would like to make direct bank deposits, electronic transfers or PESA link, please use the following account. The account name is Christ is the Answer Ministries. The bank is Cooperative Bank University Way Branch. Our account number is 011-280-617-639-00. The SWIFT code is KC-O-O-K-E-N-A. Once again, we want to appreciate every one of you for every support you give, whether big or small, to keep the ministry running. We are however aware that in this season, there are some of us who may not have even food to eat. If you are such a person, please get in touch with your safari group leader and we will see how to help. God bless you. Coronavirus is a, a pandemic that has hit the world and everybody in the world is affected in one way or another. The truth is that whereas some are coping, many others are not, especially those people who have lost their sources of livelihood. It is this team, this group that we as SITAM have set up an initiative called Bread of Life uh, so that we can reach out to them with something small that can help them go through this uh, very difficult season. The Bread of Life campaign is an initiative where we are calling upon each and every one of us to make a small contribution. We have found that as little as 1,000 shillings can feed a family of four. And so we are giving you an opportunity. You can use our M-Pesa number, which is uh, right there on the screen. And you can send your resources, whatever amount, no amount is too small, no amount is too big. And we will be able to send this money through digital vouchers that will go to targeted individuals that have been identified in a very systematic manner that can help them be, go to any shop that is a uh, uh, Lipana M-Pesa, then they can uh, redeem that voucher and buy food 
for themselves and their families. So we appeal to each and every one of you, if you could give something small so that we can support those of our friends who are in need. Thank you for your support. To bring us God's word to you is none other uh, than Reverend Ken Isige. He is married to Jen Isige. They are blessed with two uh, teenagers. And just before he comes, would love to hear uh, and listen to uh, another song by the worship team. And please, if you're there, feel free to sing, feel free to dance along. And I believe you will enjoy as we move along. God bless you. team and God bless you. Thank you for that lovely ministry. And I want to greet us all in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I thank God for this day. This is the day that the Lord has made and it is a privilege and an honor. I count it as a privilege and an honor to be able to just minister the word of God to you this morning or today uh, through a platform such as this. I'll be speaking to us today on the topic, my brother's keeper. We are living in peculiar times. Most of us have never gone through what we're experiencing today with this global COVID-19 pandemic. Our lifestyles have been changed. Our economy has been adversely affected. New terms have been introduced in our vocabulary. One such term, is social distancing. Previously, perhaps only epidemiologists and medics were familiar with this term. They may have learned about social distancing in their course of studies, but now it has become a buzzword in our homes and in our societies. Wikipedia defines social distancing as a set of non-pharmaceutical interventions or measures taken to prevent the spread of a contagious disease by maintaining physical distance between people and reducing the number of times people come into close contact with each other. It avoids keeping a distance of six feet, that's about two meters from others, and avoiding gathering together in large groups. This term has redefined fundamental aspects of our culture. I recall for the first time 
standing before our congregation on the morning of Sunday, the 15th of March, this year, 2020, trying to explain to and show our congregation alternative ways of exchanging greetings. This was just a couple of days after the first positive coronavirus case had been reported in the country. I'd never imagined that as a pastor, I would stand before our congregation and urge them not to hug and not to peck on the cheek and not to hold or shake hands with each other and not to high five one another. I'd never imagined that. Recently, as I watched the evening news, one of the media houses carried a story where a father, Amze, at the village was saying that he didn't want his children, his very own children, to come and visit him from the city. He said, Wakae uko Nairobi. That's what he said. This Mzee went on to explain his reasons for saying so. He didn't want his children to inadvertently expose or infect him with the coronavirus. Our government, and rightly so, just like many governments across the world, because of this deadly and contagious COVID-19 virus, has directed that all citizens are to practice social distancing. We are to stay at home. We are not to congregate in large gatherings. We are urged not to travel up country to visit our elderly parents. And I encourage us to adhere to all these measures and others that are being implemented to avoid the spread of this coronavirus. But as we practice social distancing as believers, we must do it in a way that upholds Christian values. In the Bible, Jesus Christ told a story from which I believe we can draw some vital lessons on how we can practice social distancing while upholding Christian values. That story is found in the book of Luke, chapter 10, from verse 30 onwards. I just want to read six verses. That's Luke, chapter 10. So you could just either swipe your device or open your Bible to Luke, chapter 10. I'll be reading to us from the New American Standard Bible, I want to read to us from verse 30 to verse 35. And this is the story. A man was going down to Jerusalem from Jericho and fell among robbers. And they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down on that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, who was on a journey, came upon him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion. And he came to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii. And gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. This story told by Jesus is one of the most known parables that he told. Many of us know this parable as the parable of the good Samaritan. I invite us to look at this story together. Secondly, we'll draw from lessons from the story. And then finally, as part of the lessons from the story, I'll draw our attention to the reasons why Jesus told this parable. But let's begin by focusing our attention on the story. It's an amazing story. It has four main characters and what I'd call some supporting characters. The main characters are, number one, the man who was beaten and robbed. Secondly, the priest, thirdly, the Levite, and fourthly, the Samaritan. Immediately, by just considering these characters, one can see a number of tensions in the story or in the society where these characters lived. These include ethnic tensions, 
The priest and the Levite were Jews from the tribe of Levi, while the Samaritans were a mixed race because of intermarriage between Israelites and a number of other nationalities earlier on in their history. According to the law of Moses, the children of Israel were not to intermarry with other nationalities. So by the time of Jesus, historians aver that the Jews hated the Samaritans. They considered them to be an impure breed. According to the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 9, the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. Secondly, there were religious tensions. The Jews and the Samaritans had some fundamental differences in their belief systems. According to the Jews, the center of their worship was strictly confined to the temple which was in Jerusalem. That's where they made pilgrimages every year and made sacrifices to God at the temple in Jerusalem. For the Samaritans, they worshipped God on Mount Gerizim as recorded in the Gospel of John again, chapter 4, verse 20. But we also see that there were social tensions evidenced by the presence of crime and violence. So this story is set in a multi-ethnic, a multicultural, and multi-religious context where there was some crime and violence. A context that is very similar to a number of towns and cities of the world today, Nairobi being one of them. As the story begins, we're introduced to a traveler. We're told that the traveler was a man and that he was journeying, the text says in verse 30, from Jerusalem down to Jericho. On his way down to Jericho, we're told that he was accosted by robbers who went ahead to strip him and beat him and they left him lying half dead along the way. In verse 31, the story narr narrates that by chance, a priest was going down on that road. I'd like us to note that just as the traveler was going from Jerusalem down to Jericho, we're told that the priest was going down on the road. Now, Jerusalem, geographically, is located at a higher altitude than Jericho. So one traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho would be going downwards. And so the priest, being told by the text, was traveling down on that road, was traveling in the same direction as this man who had been accosted and robbed was traveling. This is significant because whereas the text doesn't directly say so, it is probable that the priest, just like the man who was robbed and beaten, was coming from Jerusalem and headed to Jericho. In that day and age, priests would be scheduled to serve in the temple for certain periods of time. And so, when one was scheduled, they would leave their home and they would go to Jerusalem where they would serve, after which they would retreat back to their home. Jericho, at that time, had grown to be a settlement for the priests. Many of them lived there. And so, in this story... As the priest traveled down that road, it is likely that he had just come from the temple in Jerusalem where he had finished performing his religious duties and perhaps he was headed home to Jericho. The narrative records that as the priest traveled down the road, when he came upon this man who had fallen upon robbers and had been stripped and beaten and left half dead lying on the road, the text records in verse 31 that when the priest saw him, he passed by on the other side. So it's like the man was lying on one side of the road and the priest deliberately distanced himself from the man after seeing him and passed by on the other side of the road. Now we're not told why the priest did this. Maybe the priest was afraid that the robbers might still be in the vicinity. And so perhaps the priest thought to himself that he needed to move as far away as possible and as fast as possible from that man. Maybe. We don't know. Maybe the priest thought that this man deserved it. That the man was a sinner 
and that God was paying him for his sins. You see, that's how people in that day rationalized misfortune. If something bad happened to you, they believed that you must have done something wrong. That's why in John chapter 9, when the disciples come across a blind man, they come to Jesus and they tell Jesus, who sinned, this blind man or his parents? Maybe the priest thought that this man is paying for his sins. So let him deal with his God. Maybe we don't know. Maybe the priest felt that by approaching and helping this man, that he might defile himself. According to the law of Moses, priests and Levites had numerous regulations about ceremonial cleanness. Maybe one of those laws conveniently popped up in the priest's mind. And when he saw the man, he thought of this law. Maybe we don't know. Maybe the priest knew that there were likely to be other priests and Levites coming behind him. And so this priest may have thought, let those other guys who are coming help him. And so he moved aside and went his way. What we do know from the story is this. The priest saw the man and distanced himself from him. The priest must have, must have had what was in his mind a very good excuse for not helping this man who was lying there on the side of the road, hapless and half dead. After the priest passed by, we're told in verse 32 that a Levite came. Allow me just to quickly explain to us the difference between the Levites and the priests. Both of them were from the lineage of Levi, Levi being one of the tribes of Israel. But the priests were specifically from the lineage of Aaron. Aaron, you remember, was Moses' elder brother. And so the priests had the duty of offering sacrifices and incense at the altar on behalf of the people. The Levites, on the other hand, they would assist the priests in various duties in the temple. They would serve as musicians and temple guards, what we call ushers today. And so the priests, as it were, were of a, you know, maybe one can consider them as a, at a higher social class, such that the Levites looked up to the priests. And so in verse 32, the narrative records, likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. And so the Levite behaved just like the priest he distanced himself from this man who was lying there half dead. We are not told why this Levite also did this. Perhaps the Levite thought, I know that that priest went ahead of me. And that priest must have come across this man lying here. Why didn't that priest help him? He must have had a good reason why he didn't help him. And I, just being a Levite, who am I to try to help this man when my own priest won't help him? And so the Levite distanced himself from this man. And so the priest and the Levite, who are believers in God, they came from the house of worship from serving God and his people. But when they saw this man lying there in desperate need for help, they distanced themselves from the man. The point that I'd like us to get here is this. As believers, we must be careful not to justify our wrongdoing with quote-unquote good excuses. And it's very easy to do that particularly in times of crisis. It's easy to hoard things and to keep things to oneself in the pretext that you don't know when this crisis is going to come to an end and to pass the responsibility of helping one who is in need to someone else. Yet we don't know who that someone else is or if we do, that other person may not be there at the time of the hurting person's need. 
as you and I engage in the practice of social distancing, let us not distance our hearts and minds from one another or from those who need our help. By that I mean not empathizing with the needs of those around us and not engaging our minds and resources towards helping. Keeping a safe distance in order to prevent the spread of a disease does not mean ignoring the plight of those among us who are needy or vulnerable in one way or another. Social distancing doesn't mean social disconnection. The story doesn't end there. Another person is traveling on that road. Verse 33 continues to say, but a Samaritan. Notice here how verse 33 begins with the word but. Immediately, we can tell that something different is in the offering, marking a distinction between what happened before with the priest and the Levite and what was about to happen. And so we're told, but a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay. The Samaritan, we are told, came upon this man, this man who had been beaten and stripped and was lying half dead on the road. He came upon this man and saw him just like the priests and the Levites. But unlike the priest and the Levite, what we're told is that when the Samaritan came upon him and saw him, he felt compassion for him. And this was not just, you know, we have an expression in, should I say in our language, in our local slang, a word is pronounced woshe. It was not just this woshe kind of feeling that just expresses despair and says, ay, woshe. No, it was a compassion that moved him to action. We're told that the Samaritan came to him. He bandaged his wounds. And I wonder, where did this Samaritan get bandages? Perhaps he used some of his own clothes, ripping them up and using them as bandages. We're told he poured oil and wine on them. Those must have been provisions for his journey. And it's unlikely that the Samaritan was going to Jericho. Remember, Jericho was a settlement for priests. Why would he go there? So it was not a, perhaps it was not a close journey that he was making. Maybe he was going further and that's why he was carrying provisions. But he doesn't hold back his provisions. He freely uses them to minister to this man. We're told he put him on his beast. He brought him to an inn, took care of him. And the next day, the next day meaning he spent the night with this man. The next day he took out two denarii, that is two days wages, and gave them to the innkeeper, telling the innkeeper, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay. Notice. When I return, not if I return, he made a commitment that I'm going away. And as I go, I'm going to look for more resources. And I'm pledging to come back. And anything that you have spent on this man, I will repay you. This Samaritan did what he could with what he had in the circumstance to help this man in his desperate situation. Beyond that, the Samaritan implores the participation of the innkeeper to help the dying man, telling the innkeeper, spend on this man whatever is needed and I pledge to pick up the bill upon my return. The Samaritan committed to go and look for money and come back to pay 
any pending bills. Notice that all this time, we are not told any word that this man who had been beaten spoke or said to the Samaritan. We are not told that this man said, oh, thank you very much. I appreciate you. You are so kind and generous. I'll make sure I'll pay you back or return the favor when I get back on my feet. We are not told any of those things. And you know, some of those words, they encourage some of us to give. And for some of us, they stroke our egos. We feel better. But not a word is mentioned or said to the Samaritan. The Samaritan is propelled to act out of compassion. Simply because he saw this man who needed his help. Reflecting on this story, one Bible commentator puts it this way. The robbers looked at that man and said, what is yours is mine. And they went ahead and they stripped the man, beating him half to death. The priest and the Levite each looked at the man and they said, what is mine is mine. And I'm not willing to share it with you. Not even if you are on your deathbed. But the Samaritan looked at this man and said, What's mine is yours. And I'll gladly share it with you. And I want to ask you this. What do you say? In which category do you fall? God calls us to use what we have to minister to those in need. Remember this, whatever we have, we have received it from God. He has allowed it to be in our custody for the time that it is in our custody. We are only managers of the things that God has given us. All the times, whether good times or bad times, God requires you and I to practice love and compassion for one another. It is usually in the times of crisis that Many need genuine love and compassion and concern, a helping hand to get them through a dark season. Allow me to conclude by addressing the matter of why Jesus told this story. Jesus told this story in response to two questions that he was asked. Those questions were posed to him by a lawyer or a teacher of the law. The text is found just before the section we read. It's in Luke chapter 10 from verse 25 following. And verse 25 says this. This is the question that the lawyer asked. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Verse 26. This is Jesus' response. What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And the lawyer responds and says this. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbors as yourself. And Jesus looks at this man and tells him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. By this, Jesus was affirming that you cannot separate the love for God from the love for one's neighbor. You cannot purport to love God while at the same time failing to express compassion. That is love in action to one's neighbor. After this lawyer had heard the response, he posed another question to Jesus. And this is the question he asked. And who is my neighbor? You see what the lawyer was trying to do is to draw a perimeter around the people that he may consider to help or to love. The lawyer was doing exactly what the priest and the Levite had done. And that's what prompted Jesus to tell this story, the story of the Levite, the priest, and the Samaritan. We've already seen the lessons and drawn lessons from the story. 
And after telling the story and after them picking the lessons, Jesus asked the lawyer a question. That's recorded in chapter 10 of Luke verse 36. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell amongst the robber's hands? And this lawyer, I imagine, looked at Jesus and he said this, the one who showed mercy to him. And then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. The point that Jesus was making was this. We are to help those who are in need, whoever they are. Not just those that we have enclosed in our friend zone. Not just those on our contact list, on our email list. No, those who come by our way, who need help, we are to help them. Such love and compassion is the hallmark of true Christian character and behavior. This is the love that God himself expressed and continues to express to you and I. John chapter 3 verse 16 tells us this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God gave of his best that we might live. We also are called to give that which we have, that we may lend a helping hand to those who are in need. And perhaps you're listening to me and you are feeling that you have been beaten and stripped by life. And you recognize today that God has given himself or of his best. He has given Jesus to pay the penalty for your sin. And you're wondering how you can live this life that Jesus offers. I want to pray for you that you may receive Jesus. So let me ask you just to bow your head. If you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, just bow your head and say this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus Christ, I come to you today and I confess that I am a sinner and I need you to save me. I open my heart to you and I ask that you would save me from my sin. I receive you into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior from this day forward and help me to live for you all the days of my life. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And if you said that prayer, I want to urge you just to comment on the sections on our social media pages or you could just send us an inbox on any of our social media pages and we'll be able to get to you. But I remind you this, as we practice social distancing, let us not be disconnected. Let's help those who are in need. Let's use our resources to be a blessing to those who need that from us right now. By so doing, we'll be keeping or keepers of our brother. And together, we will live and honor God for his glory. Thank you and God bless you. Amen.
Hallelujah. What a powerful message. Thank you, Reverend Kenny Sige, for bringing that word with such clarity. And thank you for that reminder about us being our brother's keeper. That we should not distance ourselves from those who are in need. We should not ignore the plight of those around us. And social distance does not mean social disconnection. My brothers and sisters, God is calling us to use what we have to minister to those who are in need. And therefore, I call upon us to rise to the occasion and be counted as our brother's keeper. And you want to believe that during this time and this season, you will allow the Lord to use you as an instrument of his love. Thank you for being with us. We pray that the Lord will be with you in the course of the week. And as you continue praying and trusting God together with us, that this season will pass. And we believe that God has called us at a time like this to be the one to share his love with our brothers. And therefore, I pray that may the Lord bless you. And may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you. And may the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you. And may the Lord give you peace. May you be blessed as we continue waiting on the Lord and as we purpose to be our brother's keeper. God bless you. As you may be aware, the regional annual general meetings were scheduled to be held on 14th March, 28th March and 4th April for Western, Southern and Northern regions respectively. The Western Region Annual General Meeting proceeded as scheduled at Sitam Kisumu on the 14th of March. Unfortunately, due to the restrictions in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, the pending RAGMs for Southern and Northern Regions, together with the ADC, were deferred until further notice. This decision was also informed by consultations with the Office of the Registrar of Societies. The current CETEM leadership structures remain in place until such time as the statutory meetings can be held. We continue to call for concerted prayer for God's intervention and a quick ending of the pandemic. Just want to say a very big thank you. 
We want to say a big thank you to our God. He has been so gracious to many of us as individuals, as families, and as a nation during this season of lockdown and anxiety. As a nation and as a continent, we have seen God hold down the spread of the coronavirus beyond the earlier predictions. He is indeed answering our prayers. We especially want to thank him for protecting our medical workers who are at the front line of fighting this pandemic. We have also seen God provide miraculously for many of us. We are therefore confident that he will continue blessing those of us in need. And now we want to thank our safari groups that have continued meeting consistently through various digital platforms, many for the very first time. Special thanks to those safari groups across the country that have reached out on their own initiative to support those in need around them. Jesus said, whatever you have done to the list of this, you have done to me. And then to all of you who have remained faithful to the Lord and have continued to give sacrificially to sustain the ministry of Satan during this season, we say a big thank you. May God continue to bless you and your family and may he shower you with the richest blessings to the glory and honor of his holy name. Amen. <laughs>